Not coming because this is not a female seminar. <laughs> Greg mentioned that there was something going on at the foundation at three. Oh, oh, that was it, uh, an official thing because I remember that in the, the building, the foundation building, they kick you out as soon as the meeting is over. You cannot stay here. Go, go. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Oh, how are you? Great. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. You're coming to an Alpha seminar. Universality. It's been interesting. It's a Renaissance man. <laughs> Holy man. Yeah. Well, I think she, she's the Holy man. And I just want to see what's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> yeah, but now we we're talking about you. Wow. We we're talking about you, okay. right? We were talking about you, right? <laughs> You are the target. Uh, Eliezer said he'll be late, so I think I need to What about uh, Sergey? Sergey went to take lunch and then he never came back. Let me go. Let me go. I think he's here or something. In the 50s, there would be like a three martini lunch. So I don't know if he's doing like about like about like you know in the 60s and 50s like about it was small oh yeah i see that explain i was wondering how So do you need any more not coming? They are still at the Bible? Because David told me that he was coming here. David's here. David's here? Huh? Big David or little David? Well, the, the big the little David was 55 yesterday. So okay, little David. time to call him. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like as an agent, it's, it's almost like a speed limit. Doesn't depend uh, on me. Yeah, it's a time dependent. It's time independent. Okay. <laughs> so how does it work? Uh, Simon decides that it's some some very gifted guys, so they decide to give them money. Yeah, it's yeah. Like this, without yeah. applying. Exactly. There's also some things you apply. Part of no, that's now. that's understand. that's you have to apply. But this thing that David has is oh, I didn't know David has it. Yeah, Neil has it. I see. Yeah, also yeah. yeah, you don't apply. So thank you very much for uh, hosting me here on a Friday afternoon. Friday the thirteenth. Uh, what? Friday the thirteenth. Oh really? Friday the thirteenth. Then I have a, a plane back tonight on Friday evening the thirteenth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, I want to talk about aspects of the program I've been working on actually since the year I was at CERN, uh, which is this question of um, vacuum fluctuations in, in quantum gravity and, is, and specifically in a holographic context. So I'm going to have three kind of motivational introductory slides, and um, I'll say a few things, and you can uh, strongly disagree with them. Then I will pull back. <laughs> and uh, mostly just present technical results. And then I'll circle back and uh, to the controversial statements and then, and then we can discuss them at that point, okay? All right, so 
my um, initial motivation for uh, thinking about quantum gravity really was to understand space-time fluctuations. Of course, we all know that this is a waste of time and that one shouldn't think about observational signatures of space-time fluctuations because they occur at length and, and time scales that are much, much too small to be observable in experiments. But uh, we also know that in quantum gravity, that um, entanglement and non-local and infrared effects are important, at least on some sets of observables that are uh, mostly studied in the context of black hole horizons. So in case you're wondering what this picture is, this is just a picture for visual effect, space-time fluctuations. And it does seem to be the case that at least for certain types of observables, like in the black hole information problem, that the naive EFT reasoning has to break down, and that somehow uh, UV effects do not decouple in the IR. So one example that was very inspiring to me in uh, 2018 was due to Don Merrill. About 20 years ago now. And what he did was to say, let me take the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole and treat those that entropy as counting the number of gravitational degrees of freedom. And furthermore, let me just oh, give me a pointer. Okay, so you're not clear to me. And, and let me allow those to fluctuate thermodynamically with the temperature, which is just set by the size of the black hole horizon. And so now as all these pixels are fluctuating independently, they'll give rise to, uh, in that we think in the um, canonical ensemble, they'll give rise to a fluctuation in the mass of the black hole. And that fluctuation in the mass of the black hole, if you allow gravity to classically back react on it, will cause a shift in the position of the horizon, here called delta r. And he did this calculation, and I've restated it here, but it's equivalent to this, that if you look in four dimensions, that the fuzziness of the black hole horizon in this little back of the envelope calculation, depends on both the UV and the IR scale. So if this were to, if this were observable, which is not at least for any type of astrophysical black hole that we know about, the infrared scale would enter. And the reason why you shouldn't be surprised by that, at least parametrically, is that the number of thermodynamic degrees of freedom that are fluctuating here depends, of course, on the entropy. So if you write this down in any number of dimensions, it looks like this. So this, um, I found this curious. And so I've been thinking about not black hole horizons, but light sheet horizons. And what happens if there's a thermodynamic entropy or a, an entanglement entropy associated with those light sheet horizons? Okay. Could I ask just a is this, was this in the context of ABS, where it makes sense to have the thermal canonical ensemble? No, he wasn't working in the context of ABS. So then why, I mean, the mass can't actually fluctuate, it's conserved, so should it be in the micro -canonical? Well, the mass, I think if you look, I think that's true in the microcanonical ensemble. Right. But if I restrict myself to some region of space-time, then of course it can fluctuate. All right, so you're in a box. And yeah, exactly. And in fact, that's what horizons do for you, is that they effectively create a box because there's a region of space-time that you're measuring, and a region of space-time that you're not measuring, and it separates those two regions of space-time. Right, but if you want the black hole to be a thermal corrigue, thermal bath, that's directly outside, there has to be in some, in some box that holds it, because it can't be a thermal corrigue. Yeah, so in the case of um, empty space-time that we're gonna be talking about, it's the, this, the region of space-time that I'm gonna be interested in, which is, just going to be set by the measuring time of your apparatus. So you can think of this as what's the total amount of um, energy now that can fluctuate. And so therefore, uh, what is the kind of 
it's going to turn out to be modular fluctuations. And then we're going to ask about what's the classical back reaction on those modular fluctuations. So that's where I'm going. It's another question. Yeah. So, like, take like you say shifting horizon. What horizon do you mean? Do you mean like apparent horizon or event horizon? Event horizon. Yeah, short, short shield. So, uh, I, I actually don't. <laughs> Speaking. So, it, so in the case of a short shell black hole, this would just be the position where there's a singularity in the blackening factor. That's that's what's represented by this. Um, probably the apparent because uh -huh. the, the, the so, event horizon is teleological, right? Yeah. It's in the future, it so, cannot fluctuate by yeah, definition. So if I write down the blackening factor, so in ADS, this would just be a one minus r squared on l squared, for example. We're just talking about a shift in r. Okay, which just comes from, in the context of ADS, from the fact that there's a potential there, a potential response to modular fluctuations. No, okay, so this is upper horizon. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. So, um, so as soon as this becomes non-zero, because this actually just goes like modular fluctuations, then that shifts this, and that's what I'm representing here by R. Okay. It, sometimes it's just easier to write down. Okay, so this is the outline. So that, that was the um, one of the initial motivations. So now I'm not really interested in black hole horizons. I'm interested in horizons that we can measure in empty space with light sheets. And so um, uh, we're, you're gonna see how the pieces fit together with that scenario later on. But I just want to talk about some technical pieces. So the first thing I, I want to talk about is shockwaves is a laboratory for space-time fluctuations in flat space-time. So the first result that I want to show, which is in this paper with Temple He and uh, Ana Maria Roclariu, is that the shockwave metric is actually diffeomorphic to a memory metric okay, that appears in the context of celestial log. And so therefore, these commutation relations, soft commutation relations that are familiar um, in celestial holography are actually just equivalent to shockwave commutation relations that Tuck wrote down in the 80s. Okay, so that's the first result that I want to show. And so this is going to apply a quantum mechanics of shockwave operators. So now I want to pick up this quantum mechanics of shockwave operators and see what that implies. We're going to show that this quantum mechanics of shockwave operators actually implies an analog of this, these modular fluctuations that are known in the context of ADS heat. So in particular, uh, we're going to look at the expectation value of this um, shockwave effective action, which we're going to show is actually equal to the modular Hamiltonian compute the expectation value and its fluctuations, and we're going to show that they obey an area law. So that's going to be the main result. And you define what is a modular Hamiltonian. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Um, and, uh, and so then we're going to look at parametrically what that might imply for space-time fluctuations. And if I had time, we would spend some time talking about observational implications. I'm going to guess I'm going to run out of time. All right, so let's start with the first part, uh, which is the connection between gravitational memory and shock waves. Okay, so let's set up the problem. So let's just talk classically. So the question that Tuff was inter interested in is if I have a particle, energetic particle, relativistic particle falling into the horizon, and I have radiation coming out, what's the shift in the position of the outgoing radiation, which here is called x minus, due to that infalling uh, radiation. So you can just solve the Einstein equations. Here I'm going to take it, he was initially, he was interested in a black hole background, but you can also do this in flat space and just look at um, light sheet horizons. So Einstein's equation tells you that these shifts, which here are written as lowercase uh, coordinates now, eventually we're going to promote them to operators. 
depends on the momentum of the infalling particle, there is a green function, a transverse green function that just goes like, uh, which is just written here as G in four dimensions, that's just a logarithm. It's integrated over the transverse directions, which are called C here, and then there's some metric on that transverse space. Now what Tuff did, and I'm not gonna go through the magic of how he reasoned this to be the case, but what he said is that I'm gonna promote these uh, momenta and shifts, okay? So these are really momenta and coordinates to operators. And he decided to make actually these blue ones pairs. So these would be a pair and these would be a pair and that they would satisfy a commutation relation when promoted to operators that would just depend on a delta function on the celestial sphere. So I'm not gonna go through the reasoning of why it is that he decided to postulate this. One way that I find very natural is um, in the early 90s, the Berlindes actually wrote down a shockwave effective action that reproduces this equation of motion, reproduces the Einstein equation of motion, and the uh, conjugate particles that you would read off, or the conjugate operators that you would read off from that effective action are just these P and X pairs. Okay. So, uh, so let's, let's examine these commutation relations. So what we showed in this paper with uh, Temple and, and Anna was that these tough commutation relations are related by a diffeomorphism to canonical commutation relations of soft modes that appear in 4D asymptotically flat space times. So this is the program that is most well known, is being pushed forward by uh, Andy Strominger and his collaborators. And if you open up like lecture notes, what you'll find is commutation relations between the quantity, which is known as the shear and the news. These will appear in a metric that I'll show you in just a minute. And these are Poisson brackets here. So these uh, are related to these Ashtakar uh, Poisson brackets that have been known for a long time. And they're written down in terms of uh, G Newton. Again, there's that uh, metric on the transverse space, the delta function acting on the transverse space. And now here's a delta function acting along one of the time directions. Okay, so I wanna show that the tough commutation relations are actually gauge equivalent to this commutation relation, which is already, well, it's much better known. So let's see at least a few details of how that works. So if we start with the shockwave metric, and I write down my light cone coordinates, x plus and x minus, and here's the celestial sphere sitting here. So this is r squared, this is the transverse metric. Uh, and then there's gonna be a perturbation here. And this perturbation here, which is parameterized in terms of alpha on the celestial sphere, is actually just related to the stress tensor of, uh, of the, let's say, ingoing particle. Okay, so that's uh, written here as a matter stress tensor. And if I just have a particle that's propagating at some position on the celestial sphere with some momentum, at some particular time, <coughs> this is gonna be the representation of that stress tensor. That stress tensor now is gonna source a metric perturbation, which is parameterized in terms of alpha. Okay, so this is just the Einstein equation, the minus minus Einstein equation. So that's the shock rate side of the picture. Then on the other side, there's the memory metric. So in celestial holography, the memory metric in Bondi gauge now they don't like X plus and X minus, they use, so U is the analog of X minus, but they tend to like U and R instead of uh, U and V, which would be kind of more natural from a light sheet perspective. So, that, so here's the unperturbed metric, 
And then they have contributions from a Bondi mass term and a shear contribution. Okay, so this shear, what it does is to parameterize incoming gravitational radiation. And the shear now is related to the news by, uh, by a time derivative. We're going to drop this Bondi mass term. But that's there, right, because of the constant equations. It is in general there. Uh, and we're actually working on a generalization of this work where we include the Bondi mass and we actually show that you can just slosh things back and forth between the news, which typically represents the hard radiation and the Bondi mass, which is, is more associated with the soft dressing. Okay. Well, but the two components of the four components are the energy and the momentum. Those are there no matter what, the, if you're not in the theory. So that we're going to get a self-consistent set of equations. Yeah, but if m is equal to zero at all time, there is no self-consistent set of equations, except for flat space. If all the m, including d, d plus 2. If I do an expansion in R? Yeah. Even taking the leading expansion I mean, in R? It's just the, the constraint equation. There is no way to get m equal to zero, right, at all so times. You're saying that, so you agree with these equations here? Mm -hmm. So this is the UU component of the Einstein equation. Yes. And then I have a dependence on so the that, news that's here. That's true. So M, the stress tensor. But M at some point has to be non-zero, right? Because you are either throwing the away gravitational radiation. Yeah, mean? I think we're, yes, we are dropping dressing effects here. No, I'm not talking about dressing effects. I'm talking about the, if, I, I know that all the harmonics besides the, those two can be traded with soft radiation, but not n equal to zero, l equal to zero and l equal to one. The first two harmonics, which are the total energy and the total angular momentum, cannot be uh, changed by soft radiation. By trivially, I mean, you just look at the equation in the face and you see that they can. Yeah, you can integrate that over, let's say, sphere, and then the linear term will drop out, and then you have like this quadratic term. And that will give you the first two modes. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's all I'm interested in for now. So yeah, the first, then if the left hand side is zero and the right hand side is not zero, if you have some non zero news, and then, there will be some problem, the, right? Yeah, the stress tensor then sort of is going to source the is sourcing the news. So, but if you like just look at the integration of like this quantity on this field, then that would be zero because just like it is a Laplacian on the sphere. It would be D A D A D of N A D. Like integrated over the sphere, which would be zero because the sphere doesn't have a boundary. And then you will have the integration of the TUU on the sphere, which will give you the basically the zero mode. So if this is not zero, the first, the second term would be zero. And if you are assuming also the mass is zero, then there would be some problem. I guess this is what I was concerned. For the yes. high, for the L equals zero and one mode? L equals zero one, yes. But if we're interested in the higher L modes? No, then you can. Our choice of say angular momentum is based on yeah, that. but we've got a particle, a single particle that's mm -hmm. impinging in a particular direction on mm -hmm. the celestial sphere, mm -hmm. and so I don't think that we're going to be interested in the L equals zero and one modes. If you are not interested in that, yes, you can trade yeah. with the other. Yeah. yeah. So just let me say, just technically speaking, we have a comment on this. In the paper, we, where we're dropping the L equals zero on one modes, and we're just looking at the higher L modes. But we we are in the process of including the Bondi mass explicitly, and, and there's a lot of technical details. But things, the story is, is still going to go through. So um, I'm just not doing that right now because we're still working out, you know, a few of the details. But it's looking like it's basically you can just slash things back and forth between. This partial U and B in the news and get exactly the same relations yeah. and just it corresponds to the hard and the soft contributions. Again, the one the the thing that you cannot slosh back and forth is the first two modes. Yeah, but if you're looking at a particle that's impinging at a particular Z and Z bar. It still will have a mass and a momentum, so the first two modes will be non zero. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, there is no way that they can be zero. 
by letting energy and momentum conservation, which we don't agree. Yeah, so let, let, can, can we just uh, leave that as an asterisk? And uh... It's an important asterisk, though, because, you know, energy and momentum conservation. Yeah, it, what? And conservation and energy and momentum are important, so. Uh, I, I don't understand this equation simply. Simply yes, are you simple. saying that you are setting that zero for a larger than one and not looking at the first two more? I mean, you know, I Correct, yeah. That, yeah, that's okay. fine. Correct. So, um, so we're going to drop this term for the purpose of this analysis. Like I said, we're working on a generalization that um, includes the Bondi mass in, in, um, at the moment. And um, so dropping this term, you can see that the uh, stress tensor now is just uh, which now has a component, which is the news itself, plus the matter contribution, which is sitting in here. And so now uh, you can just solve this, okay? And if you have gravitational radiation, which is gonna be characterized by uh, a delta function at time, okay, at some time, because it's impinging on the trajectories of my detectors, then you can solve the uh, UU component of the Einstein equation. And what it says is that this radiation now that's impinging, which is uh, characterized by this delta function now, is gonna cause a change in the shear. So you have some initial value of the shear. I have my incoming radiation, which is characterized by the news, and it's therefore causing a different value of the shear at the end of this process. So if you were to characterize this in terms of pictures, at the trajectories of these detectors, at the incoming radiation, and now it's causing a shift in the trajectories of those detectors, the fact that the initial and the final values of this uh, shear are different is what's usually called the memory effect. All right, so this is the same thing that I just said. The shift in the shear is given by the news. And so already at the level of words, this suggests that there is a correspondence between the shockwave momentum okay, and the memory, the news on the memory side. Okay. What that does, the incoming particle momentum now is going to cause shifts in these, these light ray operators, X, which uh, corresponds to the shear on the memory side. Now I have a question. Because the shock wave, I mean, again, it, this goes back like with this comment, that the memory, I mean, you can change the memory with the zero energy expense. And just add soft radiation at very what way, like large wavelengths. And then uh, this will might change the energy by zero amount, but it will change the memory by finite amount. So the memory metric should have like zero energy. But the shock wave, we have some non-zero energy because of the, it has hard radiation. It has N squared non-zero, right? So maybe like you can say that before and after passing the shock wave, you have like memory metrics, but like suggesting these two are equal is like, I think it's kind of too much because the memory again is like blind to the energy. Or you can change the memory as you want by just adding soft radiation. So you add some, NZZ, let's say over long uh, time L, and then you take the ML equal one or order one, and then in the end, when you look at the energy, the, the change of energy would be one over L while the memory changes by a constant amount. So I do not see how this shock wave is actually now is equal to this one. You don't agree with this equation. I do agree with that, but with the suggestion, the shock wave. Okay, so the, the, this is a suggestion. So now you can just do the diffeomorphism. 
Okay, both the metrics are in bonding gauge. And there's a diffeomorphism that preserves the conditions of the bonding gauge. And it can be written in terms of just one function. And that function you can show is the same one that generates super translations. So I think that what Reza was saying is that you can change the memory in many more ways than just by shockwave. In the shockwave, yeah, you know, that's right. the, the test particles change very rapidly. But mm -hmm. you could also change yeah. the position of these test particles over a very, very long time. Yeah, that's true. That that's, just doesn't belong to this class of transformations. So there are, uh, I mean, it's not that That's true. Yeah, I'm memory. not trying to look at all possible types of transformations. I'm just going to look at this particular. Yeah, so the, and the result could be the same, though, because I mean, if you look at the position of the detectors with at some t0, and then after a very long time afterwards, you may have many different processes that give the same shift in the position of the detectors, which is also known as gravitational memory. Yeah. So I, I, I think it is. Yeah. So I'm. So this is also incidentally the form of the shockwave stress tensor. That's the reason why I'm taking this one for the for the stress tensor. I'm not. I'm, I'm interested in understanding what's the relation between writing down essentially the took commutation relations in the shockwave or in the memory gate in the memory gauge. So I'm not I'm not claiming to have the most general diffeomorphism. No no I'm not talking about general diffeomorphism I'm talking about what is called what gravitational waves will cause. Gravitational wave. I'm not even asking wave. about that. I'm asking about. I'm really just asking about a single energetic particle, mm -hmm. right? Because because that's that's what generates that's what generates these shock waves. So yes. I'm, and that will generate some memory besides the other. You mean in, in the bonding? You, you're coming back to the bonding mass. No, I'm forget about the the mass and angular momentum. I expect that the gravitational wave will also cause a memory effect. So you are finding this memory effect in the particular wave that in a particular case. In the yeah, that's right. Wave. Yeah, of course. In a particular case. Okay. Yeah, the particular case that I'm interested in. I think I'm coming at this from the opposite perspective. I'm really interested in shock waves. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm Interested only in showing that those, there is a diffeomorphism that carries me from the shock waves, shock wave commutation relations to the memory commutation relations, and therefore they're on the same footing. I'm not actually interested in the celestial logarithm side of it from that perspective, because then I'm going to work on the shock wave side. So, yes, I'm restricting myself to a particular metric. All right, so this diffeomorphism now is going to transform the shockwave metric into a form that's closely related to the bonding metric. And um, it's not exactly the bonding metric because it has these additional terms, but you can do the analysis of the symplectic form and you can show that it's not changed by these last terms. So the canonical commutation relations that you normally see in the context of celestial holography won't be changed. By those additional so now you can take a look at what happens after you perform the diffeomorphism. And one finds the two metrics are related. So the use is related to the shockwave parameter. Okay, now we've worked with a particular form of the stress tensor, which is this delta function in U. Okay, we're not. And so that implies that there's a relation because this parameter is related to the momenta, basically the integral. Uh, you can extract the momenta of the incoming up of the, of the particle that generates some shift in the metric, then it's just directly going to be related to the news by transverse uh, Laplacian. And likewise, there's a coordinate shift under super translations. So x, this coordinate now is going to shift by the super translations, and that would suggest that if you're going to promote that coordinate to an operator, which is what Tuck does, 
that I should associate those coordinates with the shear. So these are the identifications between the news and the shear on the one hand and the momenta and the shifts on the other side. So now you can evaluate the tough commutation relations. And when you do that, the commutation relation between the momenta and the coordinates, the shift in the coordinates, now it can just be rewritten in terms of commutator between the news and the shear. You can just take this from the literature. It's written down in terms of some function on the transverse directions. There's a logarithm there and then some transverse uh, Laplacians. And it turns out when you crank this through, you just get exactly a delta function on the transverse directions. So this would suggest that there just is a direct relation between the tough commutation relations, which were originally motivated in the context of black hole horizons, and these celestial commutation relations that are uh, commonly utilized in the celestial holography literature. Yes. We have some assumption of the first two modes of the P minus and X minus. I assume they do not have the first two modes. Because the first two modes would be in the kernel of that operator, right? Or box times box plus two. So they would be killed. So you may have like P minus and X minus for modes L larger than one, the commutator of two, those two modes. You cannot have them for the first two modes, L0 and L equal 1, right? So I don't want to keep going around this tree because I think we're going to have trouble talking to each other. Um, okay. We can have this conversation afterwards. I can point you directly to the comments that we make. I can tell you that we're generalizing it, including the bonding mass. The same statements will go through. But I think we're not going to have a lot more <coughs> productive discussion about this right now. Because I'm actually now just going to proceed to use these commutation relations. Which, incidentally, I, um, I thought that they were very reasonable even without the connection to special philosophy. Any other questions? All right, so now you can apply the equation of motion to this P minus X minus commutation relation. And so I can relate one of those momenta, now let's say P plus, by the equations of motion to X plus. And if I just do a raising or a lowering of that index, what it tells me is that a P minus X minus commutation relation, I can just re rewrite as an X plus X minus commutation relation. And now it's just going to go like G Newton times a, a, a transverse response. Uh, and so now we're just going to take this commutation relation, which incidentally existed in the literature since at least the early 90s, and see what we can do with it in flat space. So let's start with these commutation relations and take the quantum mechanics of those operators seriously. So we have a commutation relation between x plus and x minus. And uh, now it depends on G Newton. There's a transverse uh, green function. And there's going to be some corresponding uncertainty if the operators are permissions. So this is just a Robertson uncertainty relation. The green function was a logarithm. Just to be sure, the green function was a logarithm. Or dimensions is a logarithm because it's a little Poisson of the transverse. Um, it's a green function of the transverse of Poisson. Very good. You get the logarithm, but it goes with distance. 
Well, you're going to always be acting on a celestial sphere. So, so in practice, so I would call that an infrared divergence. Right, right. What, what's the basic value meaning of it? That's a good question. What's the, what's the basic meaning of the I mean, so <laughs> I think it's the same infrared divergence that appears in celestial holography. So yeah. it's, just a, it's just a soft divergence, which you, you might want to associate, say, with the Weinberg pool. Yes, there is an infrared divergence as the size of celestial sphere goes to infinity. So what a nice and um there's a corresponding uncertainty associated with this commutation relation. And uh, if the operators are Hermitian, and so this is just the Robertson uncertainty relation. So now you can write down the equation of motion, okay. Einstein equation, which um, can just be written. So this equation of motion is just the Einstein equation. It's actually just a rewriting of the same equation I had before. So there's a stress tensor uh, that sources these shifts. There's a transverse Laplacian sitting in there, and then it, it just if I integrate, so if you invert this, it just says that if I integrate the stress tensor over the transverse directions and along the light cone, then that's what gives me the shifts. So this is the same equation that I had written before as box alpha is equal to a delta function on the transverse directions. I have to say, you guys look like you're looking at me like I'm a complete idiot or you're completely lost. So I would prefer not to go on unless somebody is interested in what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Well, I mean, we, we are, um, there are a lot of technical questions that we brushed aside. I don't know what to do. Uh, you mean about the L equals zero yeah, in one mode? Yeah, I, I yeah. would well, say well, that. Whether the delta was a delta or a delta for L larger than two, important things. But for, let's forget that. So here you are uh, writing an equation that gives the shift. Sorry, aren't you simply rewriting the C and N in terms of U of coordinates at equal x plus and x minus? So you yeah. show that the, the two are equivalent, right? Yeah, so I probably made a strategic mistake uh, that I uh, put compressed a 30-page you know, paper into 10 slides. But it can be done. I mean, you can compress anything, but the, the so my, my question was whether you could, could have you done this with say n and c just with 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 the shear and looking at the, the evolution of the shear or if you want the evolution of the memory instead of using x plus and x minus would have been different or would have been exactly the same thing with different names can you say that again would this equation be I mean, this story would have been different than what I could have done by using the shear, just the, the Bondi representation of the metric, where instead of x plus and x minus, they look at the memory. But I think we could see an end. That's correct, yeah. That's what would be implied by the different markers. So, I mean, that. It takes one metric to the other. This equation could also be seen as equations that tell us as how the memory evolves. Correct. Right. That's correct. Yeah. I prefer to think in terms of the shock waves just because it's a I can work with this effective action, which um, just depends on the products of these shifts and on the product of the shift with the stress sensor. And uh, this effective action was written down in the early 90s. So it was already applied to light sheet horizons in the early 90s. And you can derive the equation of motion just from this effective action for the shock waves. So how unique it is, is you can have several equations, it's several actions that you can see. I, mean, I think there's probably an, you know, I don't think it's unique, <laughs> right? Because there's always a diffeomorphism that will take me from one form to another. So I don't think it's unique, but 
However, I can evaluate this on shell. Um, so, so this effect of action is directly derived uh, from Einstein gravity? Or is this just a new I was not familiar with the paper in the 90s. Uh, the paper starts with that equation. Oh, so it's just postulated. postulated. I have anyone since the 90s trying to derive this equation from Einstein gravity? Uh, so uh, you mean arriving at this action, yes. just taking, just evaluating the Einstein equation? I mean, that's one thing you could do is just evaluate the Einstein equation with the shock wave action. Evaluate the Einstein equation, uh, you know, R. <laughs> just evaluate R with the shock wave metric to get this thing. Right? So, um, so yes, you can derive it. <laughs> so, I guess from that first, you know, I'm not sure what you mean by unique, but if you take you know, Einstein Hubbard action, you evaluate it with the shock wave metric, you get this action. And then it's not surprising that when you compute the equation of motion, you reproduce the same shock wave equation of motion that you got just from directly evaluating the Einstein equation. Any other questions about this? All right, so let's work with this. So the on shell action you can show, just check it vanishes, not surprisingly, in the lower and the upper part of the causal diamond when you evaluate it on shell. But there is a contribution from a surface term. Okay, this is the one that you might normally cancel off with the GHY contribution to the effective action. And the form of that, which you can check, just looks like a product of a transverse derivative acting on these light ray operators. And so if you look at this object and you combine it with this equation of motion, so if you just plug this into here, and you do an integration by parts, to pull the second derivative and turn it into a Laplacian, one of these looks awfully like a stress tensor. Okay, so if you add in an integral over u, and then you uh, plug in this quantity here after doing an integration by parts, you end up with a quantity that looks like x times this stress tensor. And that looks awfully similar to something that is identified in the literature as the quote unquote modular Hamiltonian. So I pulled this equation out of this paper where they looked at something that they called the area operator, which they identified with something that they called the modular Hamiltonian, which was a product of this stress tensor with the shift in the coordinates, of course, integrated over uh, u, okay, which you're going to get when you apply this equation of motion, you integrate both sides over u, and then integrate it over the transverse directions. So the reason why I'm calling that the modular Hamiltonian, and they also called it the modular Hamiltonian, they called it k, is that this quantity in ADS-C of t is precisely defined. It's known to be the integral of the CFT stress tensor over a volume, which in this case corresponds to the integral over the celestial sphere and the integral along the time direction. And then there's a conformal killing vector. And that conformal killing vector, if you evaluate it, is just these shifts. Which conformal generator again? What? Special conformal generator, special conformal transformation. 
No, it's not the special conformal transformation. The conformal killing factor? Yes. It's pretty name, so. Yeah, yeah, you're saying this is a charge, right? Yeah, it's a charge. It's a charge. Which yeah, it's a, it's a generator of boost. Boost. Yeah. Boost. It's generator of boost. <coughs> that's the one that's associated with the multiple So again, what was your signal? So in the context of ABS CFT, uh, later on I have a picture. Uh, it's a um, in the context of ADS-CFT, this sigma is the Ryutakianagi surface. So you can see. The Ryutakianagi surface is the surface that ends up being relevant in the context of ADS-CFT. In this context of celestial holography, mm -hmm. it's the area of the celestial sphere. I see, so it's just the celestial sphere. In this context, it's just the celestial sphere. So U is a number of this case, or is a function of the coordinates? U of sigma. Oh, U sub sigma. Uh, so this is so. Um, so what what you should associate this with this U minus U sigma is this shift in the coordinate. So it's it's like I, I had some initial coordinate, some initial time coordinate. The shock wave comes in and it shifts that time coordinate. So the difference, that shift, is u minus u sigma. But that's a super translation, so it depends on the angle in z or it's uh, a number, I mean, a constant for all z. Yeah, when you promote it to an operator, it'll become dependent on the angle. Here it's just a coordinate. Here it's just a coordinate. So you're making a leap. In the sense that you're promoting the shift in the coordinates to an operator. But even if it wasn't an operator, a super translation, which is a classical symmetry of the theory, is a shift in U that depends on Z, right? So you right. could have chosen. Yeah, if I have an, if I have a particle that's incoming at some coordinates on the celestial sphere, yes, then that shift will be dependent on where that incoming particle. So this u, uh, when you integrate between u sigma and infinity, is this u sigma a function of z, or you just choose it to be on z? Just in this formula, right? Because my, the formula makes sense in either, either with u of sig, sub sigma being a function of z, or with u sub sigma being a constant. So I'm, well, so when I promote it to an operator, it's going to be a function just of the transverse directions. And so what this is effectively doing is it's projecting everything onto the bifurcate horizon. And so it, in this language, it's becoming a function just of the, when I'm promoting this to an, an operator, it's becoming a function of the transverse directions. I don't understand why you need to promote it to an operator, because this formula, I could write it Say classical, right? If yeah, I had the generator right. of a super translation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And indeed, isn't this the generator of super translations or is it something else? This thing here? Yeah. The, the entire integral, right? The entire integral. The, the entire integral. If you write A F sigma, right? It looks similar, but maybe it's, it's not. Looks like something that. So, this is the what they call U. K, mm -hmm. the modular Hamiltonian. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know what they call it. They don't think much. I should so know what they do, but they, uh, it just, I wanted to understand if this is an operation that translates U by the amount U of sigma, or if it's something totally different. It's not translating it by, so this is like the initial value of U, mm -hmm. and this is the final value of U. So this this would be what I would call C. Mm -hmm. So coming back to since you're you prefer the celestial holography language, if I come back to here, I have this shift in coordinates. Mm -hmm. I would say u sigma goes to some u, mm -hmm. and the shift in those coordinates is the shear. And that shear now in my language, in the shockwave language. Mm -hmm is the shift in this light ray operator, <coughs> x. 
So it, it is not that u goes into u minus u sub sigma. It's different. Yeah, so what I would read is this is u minus u sigma. So if I just bring this, this is my initial value, mm -hmm. initial or final value. So I'm taking the difference of these, and this is just my mm -hmm. shear. So this is a quantity that I'm going to call k. So what I want to do is to take this value, this uh, value of the uh, of the effective action of the shockwave action, and identify this product of light ray operators. You could call it an area operator but you could also call it the modular Hamiltonian. And so now, if you want to study the quantum mechanics of the modular Hamiltonian, that's equivalent to studying the quantum mechanics of these light ray operators. So, sorry, which ones are the light ray operators? The X's. So you'll recall the on the very them. first, yeah. So if we go back to this picture, what we were interested in was the, the positions of ingoing and outgoing radiation, originally in the context of a black hole horizon, but here in the presence of a light sheet horizon. So those operators quite literally characterize the position of a light ray. And shifts in them correspond to shifts in the position of a photon, literally, due to incoming radiation. So we have this object, which is a product of these light ray operators. And we're going to identify that with something that in ADS CFT is called the modular Hamiltonian. And now, if we take the Tuff commutation relations and we take a minimum uncertainty state, those operators now are Hermitian operators. That will allow me to compute expectation values of that, of those operators. So this is what we're going to find in Euclidean signature. So let me say more about that. So if we assume that the Lorentzian operators are Hermitian, so the light ray operators are just the same as their daggers. And furthermore, these light ray operators, which are just literally positions of particles that now have been promoted to quantum operators. Now they're written in terms of R plus and minus T. So if I continue that to Euclidean signature, then in Euclidean signature, these operators, now I've dropped the sub E, and I will for the rest of the talk. In Euclidean signature, these operators are anti-hermitian. And so now operators that are anti-Hermitian, the reason why that's a nice basis to write things in is because these now become raising and lowering operators on the vacuum state. So when you say you're an Hermitian, X plus is equal to minus X minus lambda, right? And that's an anti-Hermitian operator would be X plus equal minus X plus lambda. Um, Okay, I, I'm, <laughs> this is the relation that I'm using. That so X plus is minus X minus dagger. Okay, so they are not anti-emission, they are emission conjugate to each other or to, to a sign. Like B, BC, right? In the BC system. Or, uh, these are not details, right? That's, 
basic, basic needs. So do you disagree with this equation? I don't know what it comes from, so I cannot disagree. But so mm -hmm. this x plus or minus, so I've just taken r plus or minus it. Now I take the dagger. I use the fact that the Lorentzian operators are permission. And then you can check, just with a couple steps of algebra, that these operators now have a minus sign that you pick up as a result of the fact that there's an I sitting in here now in the Euclidean, for the Euclidean operators. So that's an analytic continuation. It's not the analytic continuation that, for instance, you do in string theory when you continue the target space to Euclidean values, right? Because there, the Hermitian conjugate stay, right? the Hermitian conjugate of the time coordinate goes into itself, but it's, yeah, it is you know, a possible Hermitian, Hermitian continuation. So you are finding, you can say that you just make different combinations. You say R plus I T and R minus F T. So isn't this just the visual conjugate that you brought to Quid in the sense future time into minus mm -hmm. so that you will be doing CFT on the ceiling? Can you can become a visual conjugate on the map, right? If what is happening, what is it? If you well, take a system that is very similar to the BC system, right? BC system. The Hermitian conjugate of C, of the cos C, is C. Sure. The Hermitian conjugate of B is B. Exactly. It's, it, they don't exchange into each other. Yeah. But since the scalar product is of the diagonal, right? exactly. when you go from, when you move one operator from the left to the right, yeah, then B. But these are not both sides. So you yeah. know, the other thing is, is diagonal. So here is the, the Hermitian the, the product is diagonal. But I thought that x plus and x minus have commutation relations, not x plus and x plus diagonal. Yeah. So you have when you have a, 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 a balina form that is of diagonal, right? There is a difference between Hermitian conjugate and conjugate yeah. with respect to that form. I will have to see by myself. So you continue, please. So here's the act as a transfer. No, I think I have the this one. It's not a stop. At least not to me. But I'm not an expert, so I am the least expert in the whole room. I would like to see what's the this really the scale of order. X minus X minus. Yeah, X and minus X minus would be zero, right? With, with lower or upper, and yes, that's right. And you put in signature too, it would be zero. And, and so that's really the only fact that I need is that these the only product that ends up being non-zero in the vacuum is uh, X plus X minus. So X minus X minus will just vanish in Euclidean signature. That would not be true in the X. So as a result, with this product of light ray operators, now if you want to evaluate it, now the only two-point function that will, in Euclidean signature, that will be non-zero will be x plus x minus. And now in Euclidean signature, the i is gone. And I just have something that goes like out plank squared, and there's also that transverse the plus in. So the transverse Laplacian, okay, something that we had before. That the, the important point here is that now you have this transverse Laplacian acting on these guys. So this delta function is going to be evaluated at coincident points. 
And so it's going to be formally divergent. And this should not be surprising to you because we, if, if this expectation value of k, as in ADS CFT or as in many other contexts, has a UV divergence in it when you evaluate it. And so you can choose to regulate it in some way. If you choose to regulate it by just taking it to be one on some cutoff scale squared in four dimensions, then what you find is that this gives you an area, transverse derivative, transverse integral gives an area, and then you have a cutoff squared downstairs. And so you can match that now, you can choose to match that, and you get that the expectation value of this operator is just proportional to the area divided by some UV scale. Okay, here I'm totally lost. Yes, because now we have, before we had the celestial sphere that has no dimensions, right? Take and five and have dimensions. Um, it has no... No dimensions. No, no dimensions. You know, length, mass, this thing. Why does the celestial sphere not have any dimensions? What is the dimension of, uh, of the latitude and the longitude? What is the dimension of 44 latitude north? The celestial sphere is a, a sphere at infinity. The well, no, angular, right, it has yeah. angular size, well, but not dimension. It, you can regulate it. You can regulate it and bring it in from infinity. Just so if you have a sphere at infinity, infinity and you take, so how do you regulate it? How do you regulate it? Just a finite it? radius for the, so you have a finite radius, which is very large, I imagine. Yeah, as long as it's system. much bigger than the Planck scale, you have a separation of scales. So now you are talking about the sphere that the celestial sphere for you is uh, a room. I mean, it's where you put in the tank. It's, some, yeah. it's uh, some size, yeah. Some radius. finite size. Yeah, it's incidentally the same way that you would regulate the RT surface by bringing the, in that case, as you're bringing the boundary in from infinity, you're putting it at some finite C. Yeah, so and then here, you, here you, it's, you can do a one on R expansion and you can regulate, bring in scry plus some finite radius, and you have a well defined expansion in one on R. So that's not the way you regulate the, the radius of an angular surface because there you have to subtract the <coughs> divergent term. Not only regulate, but also do a subtraction of a universal divergent term. Like for the <clears throat> when I'm you pretty sure I know how to regulate an RT surface. Yes. I, I guess the conclusion is uh, that, 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 that in the RT surface, once you regulate the distance from the boundary of the gas sphere, you'll be cut off. So instead, you're, you're adding a regulator which appears in the numerator. It's what gives the dimension to the area. So basically, I don't see it. I think that's what it must be. Yeah. So, I don't... So, what, so this quantity here is an integral over transverse directions. The way this, uh, these coordinates have been chosen, this is a dimensionful quantity. It has units of length. And now when I do this integral, I can choose to do the integral now over some surface. And that integral over these transverse directions is what gives this area. And it's the same same thing, same reason why these guys called this integral, they called this the area operator. And it's the same area integral actually that appears when you're evaluating the modular Hamiltonian in CFT with the stress tensor. You have an integral over the transverse directions and it gives you an area. So this is a big area. It's, the, it is, it's an area, say, of what? I, I claim that the expansion is well defined as long as that area is bigger than the Planck length. That area is just a function of your regulator. It's just your regulator. I mean, it's not a regulator independent quantity. No. Well, I. <laughs> Just coming back to the equation, like it, it has, it's true. Like I'm regulating this quantity; it's a delta function. I have to choose, you know, some scale. So we, there's different ways you can describe it. 
I can pull out G Newton and then talk about the area in terms of the number of UP regulators. At the end of the day, it's only the ratio between the two that matters. Okay. But when you do this process and you match, you know, you, there's a matching procedure that you can do to the Einstein Hilbert action. What you pull out is a one of four G Newton. At the end of the day, like this procedure does not actually fix what this UV regulator is, or to state it another way, what the ratio is of the IR to the UV regulator. I'm just writing this in a suggestive way. What I'm really going to care about is how delta K squared is related to K. Because if a delta K squared is equal to K, is that now I can do these integrals. So I can evaluate this, assume the fluctuations are Gaussian, so the four point decomposes into a product of two points. And if I do that, then I end up with an expression that looks like this. And so you can evaluate that in the same way. And you get the same divergence. Okay? And I call that divergence one on four genius. The unit supposed to be different. What? Aren't the units supposed to be different? Like, 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 so um, it is true that this regular the, the regulator that we've chosen, which is this cutoff on 4G Newton, that was put in by hand. But if you choose some regulator, what you find is that there's just the, the expectation value of K and its fluctuations just obey an area law divided by some UV cutoff squared. Typically, that UV cutoff squared from the time of Srednicki was taken to be the Planck length squared. So if you want to question me on that, it's fine. It's a long tradition in theoretical particle physics that does exactly this calculation. So the calculation is I, I want to understand what is sigma. Sigma is not the black hole horizon. The, in no, case, no, no. It's just a, a celestial sphere. Yeah, so it's some area. It's just some area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no black hole here. And, and in fact, this this shockwave action that we shockwave action. There's nothing here. It's just I, I'm saying you can get the shockwave action by evaluating the. Einstein Hilbert action in, in flat space with this shockwave perturbation. So that's the starting point. This shockwave action comes from the Einstein Hilbert action evaluated in, in the shockwave metric that I put on the second slide or whatever it was. So now, if you just grind that thing through, you get some object. I called it K. You can call it something else if you want. And if you take this two point function and you evaluate it, you get something that looks very much like the modular Hamiltonian that is well known from other contexts. To me, physically, this is not surprising that, that there's this quantity which is the modular Hamiltonian that scales with an area, and that that does not depend on the background curvature. But I can see we're past time, so I'm just gonna. So, so uh, we wanted something precise. So this quantity k, which is uh, defined this way in ADS CFT. So the setup in ADS CFT is that you have a boundary. You can regulate the boundary. You have an RT surface. You can compute either on the CFT side or on the ADS side the expectation value of this quantity, which is known to be the entanglement entropy. And you can also compute its fluctuations. And they're known to be just an area law of this RT surface. And there, uh, you don't have to regularize anything. 
already been regularized for you, is actually just computed to be AM42. So it's a different context. This is a Ryu Takinagi diamond in empty ADS. What we're looking at is diamonds in flat empty space, and they seem to obey a very similar area law. All right, so I'm just going to skip to the end because I'm past my time and uh, say that there seems to be a relation between the top commutation relations and the soft commutation relations that if you take the shockwave effective action and you evaluate the vacuum expectation value in Euclidean signature that you get an area law. That's similar to what's seen in ADS-CFT. And the thing that I didn't have a chance to say is that these modular fluctuations now, this modular Hamiltonian goes like the two point of these length, of these uh, shifts in the position. And these modular fluctuations, which it's known in ADS-CFT, these are the quantities that gravitate. This goes like the four point of length fluctuations. So. When you work it out, it turns out that the length fluctuation, if you just work out naively what would happen, is that it would go like a square root of G. Uh, but I'm not going to comment on observations. So I'll stop there. So if you apply, I mean, there are, there's a lot of things missing, but if you apply this, uh, uh, formula uh, to an interferometer, right? When you say that you, you want to see an effect when you have a, a photon going back and forth in an interferometer. What is, how are the parameters of this interferometer, you know, the size related to this area we have seen? Is there any... So the way that it works is um is this. So, so the so these light ray operators are just related to the components of the metric. So these shifts are really just a one-to-one -one map with metric perturbations. So um, the system that we're considering here is light sheets. Now, when I say that we're taking the celestial sphere to have a finite radius, uh, it's, it's a finite radius, but it's much larger than any microscopic scale. So if you just rewrite this, these light ray operators, I wrote this down on one of the very early slides, are just related to integrals of the metric along a light cone direction. So this quantity here is actually very closely related to uh, metric fluctuations that you measure. So these modular fluctuations now, so this is the quantity that I called the modular Hamiltonian. Actually, it's the integral over the transverse directions. This is the quantity multiplied by G Newton that I call the modular Hamiltonian. And so that quantity differs from this quantity here, differs from the modular Hamiltonian by a factor of G Newton divided by the area. So then if you just do the back of the envelope, and you know that it's actually the modular Hamiltonian, the fluctuations in the modular Hamiltonian that gravitate and just do a back of the envelope. I'm not going to claim that this directly corresponds to an observable. But if you do that estimate, it's the four point of these shifts. Okay, now these are just position operators evaluated in the vacuum. And this is just differs, as I said, by a factor of Newton's constant divided by the area. 
and I'm evaluating this squared because that's what goes into delta k squared. And then there's a factor of delta k squared. Delta k squared has a divergence in it. It's an a, it feels like a on g newton. And so this four point function scales like one power of g newton. So that would lead to a counterintuitive scaling that these shifts go like g newton to the one quarter power, also known as the square root of the Planck length. So I am not going to claim that this is a proper observable. It's not. However, these shifts are related to metric fluctuations. Metric fluctuations are what you measure in gravitational wave experiments. And so if you work out the parametrics of it, if this does survive a proper gauge invariant calculation, then it would suggest that the vacuum state has is inhabited by a large number of very soft modes. The number of soft modes that are sitting there is fixed by the area of the uh, bounding the volume of space time that you're measuring in your experiment. Sometimes I've asked what what fixes the surface. Well, if I take a point and I look at the causal development, what shape does it create? It's a ball. <laughs> okay. So if I take a, you know, start here and send a photon out and have it come back, the volume of space time that's in causal contact, that's the causal development of a point is a ball. And that's the reason why the relevant area is a sphere. It's the surface of a sphere. That, so that, that, and the reason why is if you think that the divergence that appears in the entanglement entropy, which itself is not observable, but that comes in the fluctuations of the entanglement entropy, which do graduate, which do gravitate, they're known to gravitate, then this back of the envelope would suggest that they have, they're more enhanced than what you would expect simply because there's a large number of soft modes. It's not a single graviton effect. So that's the essence of it. So uh, you could have, here the, there is no shock wave at the end, right? I mean, you are just using well, like, shock waves are, to motivate this. That's right. So, so, right. So what we did, so what's the reasoning? The reasoning is, well, let's, yes, you had energetic particles and that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the vacuum. So what's happening?